commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. wonderful speaker come up uh, to talk to you right now, Deacon Ralph Poyo. Um, read a little bit about him. He's a founder of New Evangelization Ministries, and Deacon uh, seeks to be a useful tool for assisting pastors in training their parish leadership in evangelization, which is very important. He has traveled extensively around the United States, serving as an evangelist and a speaker. He incorporates what he's learned and experienced in five years of research in the rural inner city and suburban parishes. Almost 30 years of parish ministry, he understands the complexities of various ministry environments. And of course, I want to mention that he's the father of five daughters. I'm the father of four daughters. And then, and then I said, are there any twins in there? And he said, yeah, I have twins in the end. And I said, oh, I have them in the middle. So we both have a set of twins and he has a, a his, a high school sweetheart, Susan, he's married to. I know you're going to be blessed, so open up your hearts for Deacon Poyo. I am a deacon in the Roman Catholic Church. I've been ordained 10 years, and um, I am a father of five daughters. I married my high school sweetheart, Susan. I never... If you had told me that I was going to get married to a woman and have five daughters, I'm not sure I would have done that. But I did. And you know what God does. He never shows you quite what's going to happen when you go down the road, right? But there are great blessings in that, and, and they are the joys of my life. They're, my oldest is now married, and I have two grandchildren, two granddaughters. But we do have a grandson on the way. I know. I'm so excited. I don't know what to do with a boy, so I just, I bought a gun. I don't know. I don't know what to do. Because the Barbie dolls, we're done. Now we can bring out the airsoft pistols and now have little, yeah, it's going to be exciting. I, uh, I did, I grew up really in Miami, Florida, at St. Louis Catholic Church in South Miami. Um, I was the youth minister there for, I think, eight years. Um, the funny thing was that before I I had a convert. I was one of those cradle Catholics who, who went through church, went through the sacraments, and and the minute I got confirmed, psh, I left. It didn't mean anything to me. the The church didn't mean anything. The sacraments really didn't mean anything. The only reason I went through them was because you know, mom said, dad said, go get it done, and I wanted them off my back, so that's what I did. I just kind of went through the motions. But my senior year of college, a uh, high school. I had a profound conversion experience, of which my girlfriend at that time was instrumental in helping me come to know the Lord. And that was my future wife, Susan. And um, I remember I went away to college, majored in scriptures, came back, was working as a, a missionary evangelist, and then I made a vow that I would never work for the Catholic Church. Six months later... I became the youth minister at my home parish, St. Louis Catholic Church. And next thing you know, I uh, am on this amazing ride in the journey of the church, in the heart of the church, in the life of the church. And the reason I made that vow was because I was extremely frustrated with what I was experiencing, even at St. Louis. You know, people would just kind of come to Mass and punch their clock, and then they would leave. And I, I, it was very frustrating because I felt like, well, what are we doing? Because it doesn't seem like... We're, we're going deeper. We're just kind of 
were just kind of going through the motions. And is this all there really is? And then when I came to find Jesus, I, I realized that there's so much more, but we're not, we're not, we're not making the impact. It, it seemed, and this is what, what's been the culmination of all those years of, of ministry and what I'm seeing in the church today is that people treat the Catholic Church more like a country club than they do the church. You know, we come, we pay our dues, we use whatever part of the church we want, and then after that we have no other responsibility to be a part of the church and the life of the church and the ministry of the church, then that's it. And it was like, well, being a Christian is membership, membership in a club. And I, I, I was frustrated. I was really wondering whether or not, gosh, is there anything more? Is there anything else, any other life to the church besides just having to come and go to Mass? And of course, at that time, I really didn't understand Mass. Well, I've grown, praise be to God. And the, and the Lord has shown me so much. But you know, the journey of our walk and the journey of the Christian walk has to be more than just what we um, go to church to receive. Because it's not that we have to go to the Lord, but the Lord has already come to us, right? But the problem, if you're anything like me, the problem is, is that when we do, when we go through this journey of life, Satan is so good at keeping the blinders over us that we don't really see what's going on. We don't understand the ways that God is really attempting to, to break through into our lives. We don't understand the ways that Jesus is trying to reach out to us. And now, of course, you know, hindsight is always 2020. We look back and we can see these amazing things that God did for us. But we can't see him in the moment. And so I felt I really wanted to know, is God real? I remember as a high school senior asking this question. I said this in, in great arrogance. I said, big deal, Jesus died 2,000 years ago. What's he doing for me today? But you see, that's, I think, what is the longing of the heart of the United States today. They really want to know whether God is real, right? I mean, we've heard the stories. We know. I'm speaking to the choir. You know what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. You know about the crucifixion. You know about all that stuff. But they want to know if he's real today. And what's in the way? What's in the way that's preventing people from understanding that God really is real and he's alive and true? But I'm, I'm finding this as I'm going around and I'm doing a lot of retreats, particularly men's retreats. And I notice that the room is mostly filled with... Don't be so proud of that, ladies. But I remember going, I was in, I was in um, Central California and I was, I was um, leading a... a a retreat for men, and I got up there Friday night, and I had my notes, and I was ready to go, and I, five steps before I got to the podium with my notes and my outline for my talk, the Spirit said, we're not going there, follow me, and all of a sudden, I just said, okay, what do you want me to talk about, and he just said, open your mouth, and I opened my mouth, and he said, and I began to real, and listen to what the Spirit was saying, and he basically said, you know, we can take you through all the training." We can take you through all of this stuff on what to do in evangelization, discipleship. And particularly when I was talking to the men, I said, we could lay out an entire weekend of a retreat of how to inspire you to grow deeper in your faith. But the bottom line is this. Is that you won't respond to it. Because you're only going to respond to the place with which your fear allows you. See, what's the benefit of me going through an entire weekend if in the end you're going to leave here and you're going to go back to work, you're going to go back to your places, and you're still going to be afraid to reach out and say hello to a stranger? What's going to be the value of encouraging you to grow in your faith? And you might grow closer to Christ, but when it doesn't be become manifest in your interaction with everyone else around you as I confronted the men. And then I, I had a clip on my iPad that I put up on there, and it was the opening scene to the movie um, Saving Private Ryan, where the men hit the beach. It's a horrible scene, filled with fear. And that's what we examined, is fear. We just looked at fear. What is it that makes us afraid? Because you know what? In this country, if you want to find corruption in politics, you follow the money, right? Right? If you want to find corruption in the spiritual life, 
what Satan is doing to corrupt your spiritual life, follow the fear. Because that is what his number one weapon is to prevent you from becoming what God desires you to be. Fear. And fear comes at us in a wide variety of different ways. But there's one particular way that I wanted to address this, this afternoon. In the midst of the storms outside. I'm in South Florida again. The fear is when we get wounded. I, I live in Steubenville, Ohio. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a little steel mill town in Steubenville, and there's a university there. And I was talking to a the professor there, and, and he's a good friend of mine. His name is Bob. And I said, Bob, you know, the university does a great job of preparing um, their students to go out into ministry. I think they, they graduate about 130, 140 catechetics majors every year. The next university in the country, I think they, the, the, the next highest graduating class is 30. So they really put out a lot of ministers. I said, but you know, here's the reality. The reality is, is that when we get out into the mission field, when we get out and start working with the people, Satan is not going to challenge you on whether or not you remember a scripture verse. He's not going to challenge you on how well you have command of the scriptures or how well you know the catechism. Satan's going to attack you at the place where you're most vulnerable and broken. And if we don't know how to deal with those parts of our lives, if we don't and have not addressed those parts of our lives, that is where Satan attacks us and does not allow us to begin to minister. I know in my life, when I first started as a, those first two years out of college, I was afraid to lead someone to the Lord. I was afraid to turn the corner. I was afraid to come up to a, to a guy and say, hi, I know Jesus, and because I know Jesus, and let me tell you about him, and I and explain the story to him, and I was afraid to ask the big question, do you want to ask Jesus into your life? You know why? Because I was afraid. I was afraid he would say no. But you know what I've learned? My job is not to make him say yes. My job is to bring him the question. Right? So if that's my job as an evangelist is to bring the question, I don't, I don't have to worry because that's not my bra job. My job is not to turn his heart. That's God's job. And last time I checked, I'm not God. I'm just me. So... Where is the fear, probably the biggest fear, that Satan will use to prevent you from rising up to become this church that we so desperately need? If, again, if you're anything like me, we all have history, yes? We all have places where we've been wounded. And this country, Satan behind this country, has trained us. I'll prove to you the training that you've received because it's a lie. You know it. Ready? Here it comes. You repeat. You finish the statement. Out of sight? Yeah, that's a lie. How about this one? Time heals all? That's a lie too. God heals all wounds. But what do we do? We get wounded and then we bury it. And then we pretend that if we just sit on it long enough and try to forget that it ever existed, then it's just going to go away. But the minute you come close to touching even a part of it, all of a sudden we're like recoiling, right? We're, oh my gosh, and we're so afraid, and we do that. I'll tell you this interesting story. I was, I was a youth minister, and I was leading a retreat. I had about a, a hundred kids in this patio area, and... Um, it's a screened-in patio. It's in South Florida. And behind, outside, through the screens, was just this big open ball field. And I'm there, and I'm giving my talk. And I, I don't even remember what the talk was about, but I remember this little girl who was in the group. And about three-quarters of the way of my talk, she just gets, a, you could see the emotion. Her face turned red. She immediately got up, and she ran outside the door, the screen door of there. And I looked over, and I nodded to one of my female leaders, she nodded back, she got up, and she ran out to the field. And I watched the girl go out into about 100 yards away out in the field, and she just collapsed in the middle of the field and just, you know, put her face in her hands and started to cry. Just, you could see her wailing. And my leader comes up as she would just to love her and to be close to her and, and to, what's wrong, right? Like any one of you would do, Right? And, and you look at, and I, I'm trying to give my talk, but I'm also watching what's going on outside. 
and now they're both on their knees and they're facing each other and I, and I see the leader ask what's wrong and I see the student begin to tell this story. And then as she told this story, all of a sudden, I watch my leader get up and run away. And I looked at the girl and she doubled over and started crying even more. So I took the last 15 minutes of my talk and ended it in five minutes and gave everybody a break and I went out, found the little girl, found out she had been triggered in the talk about a, a wound in her life with her family. Had my conversation with her and then I went over to the cabins, the women's cabins, and looked for my leader and there was my leader on her bed curled up in the fetal position, crying. Why? Because she had experienced what the little girl had experienced. And she had never dealt with it. She just buried it and tried to pretend, which, by the way, is called living a lie. She tried to pretend that it wasn't going to bother her anymore. Listen to me. The psalmist comes to us and he tells us, be still and know that I am God. But if we're not prepared to deal with our woundedness and our baggage and the things that surround all of that, we will not be still. Because the first order of business of our loving Father is to heal us so that we can function. Yes? I know that is true. I know that from my own personal experience. You see, when I was younger, I was the youngest of four boys, and I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and my... Um, uh, three older brothers were four years and older than me. And so oftentimes I was left to myself. I was the kid who would jump on his bike and I would, I would shoot missiles from my handlebars and blow up cars. I was really good. I never missed. And then sometimes I would go down to the basement and I would play army, you know, because the enemy had kicked in my basement door and it was my job to protect the house. So I had to go down to the basement and I had to kill all the enemy with my guns imaginary guns that I would pull out of my shirt. Don't laugh. It's real to me, okay? You're so cruel. And so one particular weekend, we had this relative visiting our house, and it was all kinds of commotion Friday night. We're up late, and all of a sudden, we're, you know, we go to bed, and <clears throat> I wake up, and the house is really quiet, and everybody's gone except for my mom and I. And I'm thinking, well, gosh, everybody's gone. What am I going to do? So I thought, well, am I going to go on my bike, shoot missiles, or well, I'll just go down to the basement because I'd had some cereal and some breakfast. And then I went down to the basement, and as I walked down to the basement, I'm going to speak cryptically because I see little, little ears here. I walk down to the basement, and I'm, I'm playing army, and I'm clearing out room by room, and aha, there's this makeshift bedroom we've got down in the basement. The light's on. That's where they are. So when I rounded the corner, there was that relative that was visiting. He was, that was where he slept last night, and he was on the bed, and he was looking at a particular kind of magazine. And he was doing things. Ralph, what are you doing? Nothing. Come here. He was older, an authority. So I obeyed. I was eight and a half years old. I had no idea. I had no understanding of what was going on. The only thing I knew is that when I was done, I was very confused. Very confused. And I was ill-equipped. We don't really understand the things, you know, as an adult. Now, I understand a lot more than I did when I was eight and a half. But at eight and a half years old, I didn't know that demons have the power to insert thoughts in our minds and make it sound like it's our conscience. And that oftentimes I would have a thought that it wasn't really me. I'll give you an example. Ever been to Mass? And at the time of the consecration when we're all on our knees, right? We're on our knees and we're praying and we see the host rise up. And then we get the weirdest, often gross or vile or crazy thought. And we'll go, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. That's not you. 
That's them because they don't want you to focus on him. But I was done and I was going up the stairs and I remember hearing in my voice, in my mind, you know, if you hadn't gone, uh, if um, the voice first said, you know, if you hadn't gone down to the basement to play army, that wouldn't have happened. It's true. I could have gotten on my bike and missed the whole incident. But then the voice went on to say, but because you chose to go to the basement, then what happened there is your fault. You see, we have this powerful gift called a free will. We, it, we utilize it so often, we don't even understand how powerful it is. But when the scriptures, when the scriptures tell us you have the ability to either to take captive every thought for Christ, that's utilizing our free will to accept a thought or reject it. And of course, when we're young and naive, why do predators attack the young ones? Why, when we see the animal planet, we watch the leopards or the they always go off after the young gazelles. Why? Because they're weaker. They're not as wise. They make foolish decisions. That's why. And I was one of those young ones. And so the thought comes to my mind because it has truth. I could have gone on my bike and gone somewhere else. And that's what the enemy does oftentimes is mingle deception with truth. And as they were giving some truth, I, I agreed. That's true. But then that next statement well, because you chose to go to the basement, then what happened there was your fault now lingered there, and I had a choice. Do I reject that thought, or do I accept it? And what are the consequences on either side? Well, I don't know what the consequence is if I rejected it, because that's not what I did. I accepted that thought, and I began to live a lie thinking that it was true. So the more I began to live this lie, the more I began to walk this journey. And of course, you know, the world tells you, out of sight, out of mind. So I began to bury it. And I took that little boy, and I hid him in the basement, and I pretended. I pretended that that never happened. That's why I would never go upstairs and tell my mom what happened. I would never tell anybody. I, and I made a vow. It actually became a curse against myself. I said, I will be damned if I will ever tell anyone this story. No one must ever know what happened to me. Because you see, here's the deal. I began to believe, and you know what believe is. Believe, believe, be living. I began to be living that what, I, what happened in the basement was something that I did, and therefore I was bad, I was no good, I was disgusting, and I was worthy of your contempt because I began to hate myself. So you know what the world is ready to do, right? To put on the mask, right? You know what I'm talking about. That image we put on to make everybody know that we're okay. Hey, how are you? Good. And inside, no. I'm just, I'm fine. It's all good. And what are we doing? Lying through our teeth. And this has become normal for us to just instantly lie. Why? Self-preservation. So we believe. Well, along with all of that self-hatred for myself, you know that hatred, also began hatred towards someone else. Can you imagine who? And so as all of a sudden I'm harboring this anger and resentment and it's building up towards this individual and, and I'll begin to, to start developing a pattern. People who hurt me deserve to be judged. Doesn't that kind of ring true? Somebody hurts me. Now, when we hurt somebody else, what do we want? Forgiveness. But if we hurt, but if someone hurts us, particularly when we're really innocent, they deserve to be judged. Teach everything he commanded them to teach. New ways to communicate God's word present positive images to our people. This message of truth and salvation. Culture of uh, encounter. Gospel of Christ worldwide.
Shalom World TV. Twenty four seven, faith filled, dynamic, virtue building, commercial free, family friendly, Catholic charismatic channel to the whole world. Promote the gift of church teaching. Dedicated for the new evangelization. Mentor the young into a deeper embrace of the Catholic faith. Wonderful contributions to the church. People of prayer. Attractive people, attractive messages. Peace of Christ. Promote the values of life. This is media at its very best. The voice of the church. With great love. Taking this to the next step. Shalom World TV. Shalom, shalom. 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 Shalom World, God's own channel.